This movie has an interesting reputation. In its time, it was negatively received by critics and considered to be a potential career killer for both Ben Stiller and Jim Carrey. But today, if you mention it to anyone, they'll tell you it was totally fine. In fact, not only do I think it is woefully underrated, but I also think it happens to be one of the most painfully misunderstood comedies of the last 20 or so years. So let's explore the cable guy. When the truth is found In the 90s, people flocked to Jim Carrey films purely for his wacky, energetic performances, and The Cable Guy was advertised as just another charming family comedy starring the guy from Dumb and Dumber. And then when people finally saw it, they were left jarred by it actually being more of a thriller with some very dark undertones that, as a kid, went right over my head. At the time, thrillers were a mega big seller, with the likes of Silence of the Lambs, Seven, Cape Fear, The Usual Suspects, and Misery grabbing a lot of attention. And when you look at the film's development history and its subsequent execution, it was pretty clear this was always intended to be a satire of the genre in the same vein as Scream, which would release half a year later. According to producer Judd Apatow, Kerry wanted his character to be unconventionally sinister in the style of The Hand That Rocks the Cradle and Cape Fear, in which audiences would still admire his surface-level goofiness, but as the film progressed, they'd start to see a menacing and unfamiliar side to him. The writer Lou Holtz Jr. originally drafted a quirky, light-hearted script intended to star the late Chris Farley, but once Apatow and Ben Stiller acquired control of the project, Holtz wrote several retrafts before dropping out of the project in which Apatow practically revised the entire script. Carey basically wanted to subvert his stardom, especially given he was the first actor to be paid $20 million to appear in a film, so really this was quite a risk for a comedic actor of this magnitude, hence the career killer bit, but it inevitably paid off as it effectively transitioned his career to more serious endeavours. Purely as a social satire, the film stays relevant to its time. Cable television by this point was the prime standard for public commercial entertainment. Everybody practically had a TV, and things like tiered access and pay-per-view meant audiences could pay for channels that catered almost exclusively to them. So there was less reason to leave the house, and even less reason to take your eyes away from the screen. Cable became a public obsession. In fact, tiered access felt elitist enough that people felt it truly was personal to them, and honestly probably made a lot of people popular around certain social groups like the film points out, even if The Simpsons did it half a decade prior. What do you want? I want free cable! <laughs> The Cable Guy was effectively a response to this unstoppable force of control over audiences, and it's observed in very subtle and seemingly insignificant ways, like in this scene where Steven highlights his lack of confidence to speak openly to his ex-girlfriend Robin, and just from his numbed, mindless expression you can see he's been influenced to purchase Tony Robbins' motivational material from a pretty innocuous advert. That domineering presence it gives to television then foreshadows Chip's relationship with Steven that directly follows. In some essence, you could say Chip is the embodiment of television. It's not just his constant characters, personas, and references, but the fact he's based on obsession and he's just as fiercely manipulative. Granted, today, a lot of us are less persuaded by media given we grew up with pandering and easy to access technology, but back then, things like television news, commercials, and fictional sitcoms could, and honestly still can, easily tell people how to think and feel. It really was a personification of influence, and it manifests throughout every facet of the film. In fact, in a flashback, it's revealed Chip's neglectful mother regularly left him alone to go to happy hour, which I assume she was a prostitute given Chip's casual attitude towards prostitution later on, and referred to the television strangely as the babysitter, which was his sole means of company and distraction despite pleading for a brother. All his source of knowledge and experience are molded by television, so when you see him behaving the way that he does, to him it's kind of acceptable because he didn't have the socialization to teach him about deviancy, and the blurred lines between fantasy and reality that are literally represented by the television static imply his psychological depravity. So. Television has taught him influence is the key to success, and ultimately he plays precisely into the allure that it presents, which is excess consumerism. He practically holds Stephen and a lot of the characters emotionally hostage through a belief that friendship is bought, not earned. He technically views his preferred customers as his property. He's able to convince the police to wrongfully arrest Stephen, he has the medieval staff do something completely against safety protocol, and then there's the broad materialistic culture of the time being forced upon Stephen. 
in his eyes, everybody just wants the latest and greatest entertainment and luxury, and nobody has the time to think about things like morality. You see John Doe with his Seven Deadly Sins act, or Hannibal and his murder as art shenanigans, then you see Chip's philosophical understanding of society as gluttonous for materialism, and realize, for a guy who didn't get a lot of social interaction, he's not quite wrong in his observation. I gave you free cable. What have you ever done for me? The film then has this surprisingly poetic conclusion where Chip chooses to kill the babysitter by destroying the satellite that brings an end to television's reign of control, because in his warped perspective, and really in the broad scheme of things, that's the real villain of the film. Seeing everybody break away from the television screen and embrace the real world again, well, at least to an extent, sort of plays into how we just stop caring about menial things after they're taken away from us. We only want something when we can have it so easily, not because it's essential to our existence. Hence the allure of free cable, which we don't really need, is a petty reminder of this. Yet at the same time, Stephen not accepting Chip's gift of luxury kind of breaks his cycle of influence, leading to a drastic overreaction. Granted, there is this meta-fantasy that plays out where Chip admits he's making it up as he goes along and even semi-fourth wall breaking jokes like this one show that everything feels like a twisted game to him. You know, the trouble with real life is there's no danger music. It leaves a major ambiguity as to whether Chip is actually self-aware of his actions or if there is a true, honest revelation to his deluded behaviour at the end. I mean, we never do learn his real name, it ends with the assumption he's about to terrorise someone else's life, there's the constant fantasies he plays out that become increasingly dangerous and violent, and then he exhibits this weird sexual behaviour throughout. And honestly, I'm not entirely sure you can paint an accurate picture of him, which is a good thing because it leaves you pondering the mystery surrounding him after it's over. He never falls through with anything terribly unforgivable, I mean, who wouldn't kick the shit out of Owen Wilson, but there's enough subtle mannerisms and even direct physical humour that imply something threatening we're not seeing that stops you feeling completely sympathetic off him. It creates an overriding sense of tension and at some points even dread towards Chip. And I think it's a lot to do with this subplot surrounding the Sam Sweet murder trial where a twin brother is accused of shooting his other sibling in cold blood after some long-standing dispute years following their childhood stardom. This court case lingers and develops throughout the background of the film, and its presence indirectly adds to the tone of the film's central conflict, as it always felt like it was foreshadowing something ominous given how mysterious Chip is. In fact, as a kid, I thought he was actually connected to the murder, and this led to many conspiracy theories. It juxtaposes the positivity of their on-screen relationship with the grim, sinister nature of the murder, playing entirely into the emotional manipulation of the media's portrayal of the story, something which Chip himself does when pinning his crazy dangerous antics of the medieval battle onto Stephen when charming his family. At the same time, it also contrasted with a lot of audiences' relationship with Kerry's on-screen persona, as they were seeing a goofy comic transform into a menacing stalker. And this also goes for Ben Stiller, whose goofy humour also contrasts with his cameo as the brother being accused of the murder. But of course, that social perception is also a satire on the public opinion of the O.J. Simpson murder trial that ended a year prior to the film's release, given people conflicted with seeing their footballing legend becoming a brutal killer. The fact that it even became a sensationalist movie before the verdict is even reached goes to show how quick the media attempt to capitalise and profit off real harrowing events without any moral dignity. It becomes part of that social fear of the time. Before Nightcrawler and American Crime Story, the cable guy had already pointed out fear-mongering in a society whose perception was entirely skewed by the influence of television and the media. And that's really what the cable guy is about. Impressions. Chip goes from innocuous, socially awkward loner to pure sociopath, and the film plays his tragedy and threat against each other that it leaves our feelings towards Chip in an emotionally grey area. On the one hand, it's a character study oppressed by entertainment references, and on the other, it's a romantic comedy oppressed by an uninvited clingy creep. Something always gets in the way of their happiness, Chip forces himself upon Stephen and Robin, much like how television was forced upon Chip as a child, and in the climax he seems to accept his alienated disposition and his lack of a fulfilling childhood. This desperation for a friend turns into the hunt for a brother, and ends with an opportunity to find a family that would accept him into their life. 
But all of this comes at the expense of another man's life spiralling out of control. When we see the intercutting between people glued to the trial verdict and ship falling, it really goes to symbolise the insignificance of their conflict. Nobody really cares. It's totally irrelevant to what's happening in the real world, but for Chip, this relationship literally means the world to him. Yeah, that was a lot more analysis than I expected. Next week, we're going to be looking at a Jim Carrey film that actually removed a lot of its source material's dark themes in favour of a more lighthearted adventure, but still projected some interesting notions about identity. If you enjoyed the show and want to get access to it earlier and even request your own episodes, please do consider supporting me on Patreon. There is a link in the description below, and that's what's going to help keep these lights on. Until next time, stay safe, and I'll see you all very soon. Bye! When the truth is found.